No one ever thinks of Irish sex magic. It's a world where illegitimacy doesn't even exist. She could divorce him if you told other people about their sex life. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and what you've just heard there is Dr Gillian Kenny talking about Brehan Law. This gives you some sense about what lies ahead in this episode. Brehan Law from Divorce to Irish Sex Magic. This podcast obviously has nothing to do with the story of the Great Famine, but I'm currently preparing the second last episode in the series on the Great Hunger. And this interview is a fascinating special episode to tide you over until that's ready. It returns us to the world of medieval Ireland and the early series I made on the Vikings, Ireland's High Kings and the Norman Invasion. Brehan Law was the legal system of medieval Gaelic Irish society and while this might sound dry, it's actually one of the most requested episodes since I started making podcasts back in 2010. This is in part due to the many myths that surround the topic. So for this episode, I've interviewed Dr Gillian Kenny, who will reveal the real history of Brehan Law, which, as the opening excerpts revealed, is quite different than what you might expect, but it's absolutely fascinating. Before we begin, as always, I want to thank the patrons of the podcast. People have asked why I mention this in every episode, and simply put, I wouldn't be making this show without patrons, so thanking them is an integral part of every episode. Patrons are listeners just like you who sign up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and contribute whatever they can afford to the making of the show. Over the last few weeks, several listeners have become patrons and this has gotten me closer to the target of hiring a researcher which will help to create even better episodes going forward. Listeners like you who become patrons get lots of bonus features like early access to the show, episode guides and bonus podcasts. I've also a very special feature coming up to conclude the Great Famine series exclusively for patrons, but more on that in the next episode. In each episode, I thank individual patrons, and today I want to thank Sally Shin, Michael Ash, Leonard Rafferty, Lena Goldberg, Conrad O'Dee, Jamie Fern Wexler, and Kate Crowley Rosenberg. If you want to get the extra features and support my work, you can sign up today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Now, as you might be able to hear, I have a cold coming on, so I'll leave it there and get straight into the interview with Gillian, which I began by asking her to explain Brehan Law and where it came from. Brehan Law is basically the law of um, Gaelic Ireland. Um, it takes its name from the Gaelic for judge. Um, it's a very complex a uh, very sophisticated uh, system of law. It's um, it's mainly civil. So, for example, if you if you um, murder someone or you attack them, uh, you have to pay a fine. Um, and it, there's a very um, it's a very unequal system of fines because it depends on uh, which kind of grade you are within society. So it's a very hierarchical system it's it nobody has equality before the law and um, it was the same across all of Ireland which is unusual so basically um, a, a judge could travel around Ireland and meet out the same kind of judgments and that would be accepted which is unusual in a very tight-knit um, very rural and uh, localized kind of society where did it come from um there's lots of uh, different um, opinions on that. We know it was first written down in the seventh and eighth centuries. Uh, that that is the kind of the, the the main tenets of it. Unfortunately, we don't have any case law from it, so we don't know about judgments given. Um, it then evolved between about the 12th and 16th centuries, um, and they're, they're the kind of uh, books that we know of today that we use. And within those, there's a lot of commentaries written on them. So we know that the, the laws as they stood were interpreted uh, differently according to the person and the time with which um, in which it happened. So, uh, again, it's that idea it's sophisticated. There's an idea there's lots of mad ideas about Brehan Law, but, the, you know, a lot of people say it's, it's it goes back to kind of the Stone Age. And so it's very difficult to know when it started. There's no doubt when it was written down in the 7th and 8th centuries, it was by then probably quite an old system of law. Um, so it, it, it probably goes back to, it may go back into prehistory. But, you know, again, 
it's not the same. It, it's it's never exactly the same. It changes according to what the times need. So um, the central tenets can sometimes change and evolve as as a body of law should do. Um, and I suppose that that's kind of where it came from as far as as far as we know. For people who've come across Brehan Law, they've probably come across it online and there's a lot of references it, to it being uh, utopian. And it's not really a new idea like James Connolly, a leading yeah. figure in the 1916 Rising, would have uh, talked about early medieval Irish society being almost a form of primitive communism. So I guess, yeah. can you just talk a bit about this idea that Brehan Law was... Uh, a utopian or a utopian society almost or a, a far better way of running a society than maybe it's um uh, than similar legal systems that would have existed at the time yeah sure so um i think i think you're absolutely right it is quite an old idea it's it's the idea about brehan law being somehow superior to everything else is is tied in with this idea of the noble gale and stuff like this and um, that's coming out in the 19th century and beyond so it wasn't a utopia, is is it in a nutshell, uh, Irish society in, in the Middle Ages. It was intensely hierarchical. It was a patrilineal society. I I study Irish women. Um, your life was, as a woman, for example, your life was very much trammelled in by um, people who had uh, control over you. So, for example, as an unmarried woman, it would be your father or your uncle or your brother. As a married woman, it's your husband um, to a large extent. And then as a, as a widowed woman, it would again revert back to another male. So if you compare that to then, say, the common law, which was running parallel to Gaelic law in the medieval lordship, um, single women had much more rights to enter into business, dispose of their property, and stuff like that than similar Gaelic women. So in those kind of terms, it's not. I think it can be looked on as a utopia, maybe by people who think it was sexually much freer and things like that. And they talk about the idea that people could divorce at will. What they're not looking at is the fact that I've seen in the records where divorcing at will generally meant a man walking away from a wife and children and them becoming basically indigent poor and appealing for help. Um, So there's a whole fantasy about, you know, an equality of sexes, which doesn't exist in in medieval Ireland. Um, There's no doubt about the fact that the more upper class you were, especially as a woman, you had more rights. But but it is an intensely um, hierarchical society. The idea of your status denotes everything. So in that in that sense, it's as far away from communism (laughs) as your as you're likely to get. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about it, I see, um, especially on a lot of Irish-American websites, um, about it being this amazing way to live your life in some kind of golden age. No, it wasn't. Um, you know, um, tenants under a, under a Gaelic lord, much like tenants everywhere else in Europe, suffered. Um, there's a particular practice which uh, Gaelic lords inflicted on their tenants where they went and visited them. And they would have to look after the Lord and his retinue, which often bankrupted them um, and completely put them out of business, which caused misery. There's a lot of slavery in medieval Ireland. Um, you know, so it, it's by no means in terms of medieval society, it's it's much like anywhere else. However, what's interesting, I think this is where people get the idea, is the fact that according to the law texts, uh, there are nine different types of marriage Unfortunately, people who don't read into it seem to think that this uh, designates a kind of free for all. But if you read the text, it's again centred on on your status, on on who you marry and what you bring with you to the marriage. And that determines the rights you have. And within those nine types of marriage, you're basically types of marriage that that just stop short of sexual assault or may involve that. Um, so it's not exactly ideal, um, you know, um, but but it is a myth. If I if I literally had a pound for every time someone said to me Gaelic Ireland was much better or, or the Brehens were much better. Um, it's it's reductive anyway, isn't it? To 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 kind of compare to anything else, because each system has its own pluses and minuses. But I would say on balance, um, life was difficult if you were poor. <laughs> life was better if you were rich. And in a nutshell, that that applies generally <laughs> across a lot of societies in the medieval period. So it's by no means better. So following on from that, then, 
maybe we could talk a little bit about the position of the poor in general, because under a lot of um, medieval law, the position of the poor is almost non-existent. Um, yeah. What position do poor people have? I guess what I'm thinking is under, say, in um, urban areas in the late later Middle Ages, you start to get the emergence of certain rights for yeah. people who are poor. Obviously, in medieval Ireland, you don't have urban centres of no. to such a size. So could you yeah. talk a little bit about that, maybe? Uh, OK, so, um, I mean, within within Gaelic Ireland, um, y- yeah, certainly um, you weren't getting um, <clears throat> urban centres. Um, so, I mean, again, the complexity of the laws refers to the different types of of poor that you have, uh, you have like um, bond men and bond maids. Um, so what's interesting is things like, for example, as well, which tells you something probably about the type of society it was. Um, so there's an Irish kind of, um, uh, it's a word called a crummel, which which means a female slave, and that becomes used as like a, like a like a monetary value. So you would you'd pay for things in cummels. It means three milk cows. So it's an interesting debate around it because the idea is that female slaves were highly valued, um, but they basically had no protection under the law. Um, but they were so highly valued that they became synonymous with a kind of a, a, a unit of, of co- it's not currency, but like a unit of currency. But they didn't have value under the law. As far as I can remember, the only value a female slave had under the law was if she was raped and the honor price was then paid to her husband's owner um so that's the kind of society that you're talking about in terms of um the poor themselves i mean um it, it is a society i think you have to remember that is in love with the warrior kind of caste so um you know uh you see it in the literature um all of the irish myth cycles are about that type of raiding um activity and and the warrior preoccupations it is a very patriarchal society land is handed down from father to son with few exceptions if a girl inherited she generally married her cousin because otherwise it left the family and um, so it, it is a society which is in love with the upper classes which always comes as a as an amazement um to people who who might chat about it they seem to think it's some kind of egalitarian utopia no it most certainly isn't uh, so to be poor, um, like at any other stage, really, was difficult. However, what I've seen in, in my work and in the work of others, and particularly for women, which, which I um, concentrate on, is when you look at, and they're not great, but when you look at town records in later medieval Ireland where you have urban centres, um, and they are, of course, you know, where common law runs, they're run by the English, um, you get quite a lot of Irish uh, female names amongst the servants um, and it could be that it was seen as an escape much like the city was everywhere else um, in in the medieval world so as a unmarried for example f- a female lower class female in the Gaelic world your value is extremely low however your stock uh, rises if you go to the city and get a job then you can save um, and then you can make your own way in the world a little bit more. So uh, you do come across it a little bit. So it may be that that was a way out uh, for some women out of that kind of poverty. Um, but, you know, I mean, our records aren't great. So there's a lot of supposition there. Maybe we could tease out a little bit more just around the issue of divorce, because I think certainly in the emails and things that I've gotten over the years, people uh, yeah. talk a lot about or ask a lot about this issue of women being able to divorce uh, and I think people probably think about it <laughs> yeah. in a very profound very modern understanding of that term so maybe you could talk a little bit about that yeah sure so um yeah you could uh, divorce at will um according to uh, Gaelic law um so again um what you have to think about is is um a balance of power within a relationship so very few women would actually in practical terms divorce their husband um, this because why? Because they would, again, go under the um, sovereignty of their father or older brother or uncle um, as a married woman as well. They had um, if they were a married woman of equal status to their husband, they would have certain rights um, about disposing of, of property and of negating foolish contracts he'd entered into, which they would immediately lose um, if they 
if they went back to the single life as the wife, for example, of an important chieftain as well. Uh, a woman was was also um, entitled to certain rents, which were traditional rents on his land. So it's a separate form of income for her. Um, there's plenty of examples of women um, managing the goods they brought with them to marriage um, and getting up to all sorts of um shenanigans with them uh, for example uh, there's some there's some um, instances where women's uh, dairies consisted of mercenary soldiers and they maintained them after marriage in a sense they told them what to do uh, there's examples in the annals of, of women raiding and attacking their husband's enemies using their own soldiers and using their own uh, resources so th- there's a there's an amount of freedom there which women wouldn't necessarily want to give up lower down the social scale you're much more dependent of course on your husband you've much fewer your options uh, so a divorce probably wouldn't be on the cards but if you wanted to you could divorce your husband for a numerous amount of things um, so the famous ones are of course if he's too fat um, which everyone laughs at because there's no equivalent um, <laughs> a husband couldn't divorce a wife for being <laughs> too fat um, but again this is uh, to do with um, you know um, really a biblical the biblical injunction on husbands to have regular sex with their wives and the idea is if they're physically incapable, which is what's signalled by being too fat, then the wife had the right to divorce him. She could divorce him if he was impotent, if he was uh, sterile, if he uh, joined a monastic order, if he told other people about their sex life, um, uh, if he was homosexual. Um, so there were ways and means of doing it. And similarly, a husband could divorce his wife. What's interesting is that is the reasons indicate the, the feelings at the time about what was important. So the husband could divorce his wife if she um, couldn't bear children, which was of primary importance in an Irish marriage, um, if she aborted uh, a baby as well, um, and if she was, you know, um, um, not loyal to him, if she was off having affairs and stuff. So, but but again, it, it's there in the laws. Um, but the extent to which, I mean, certainly from what I've seen, men did do it. They did walk away. But for women, once they start to have children, um, it, it becomes more problematic as well, because, of course, your husband has custody of your children. Um, so you lose them as well um, if, it, if it ends. So that's that's another big issue um, for women. So no doubt the freedom is there in, in principle, but whether it was actually there in practice is another issue altogether. Just moving the conversation on then, something that I'm interested in is just the conflict maybe between Brehan Law and uh, how much it interfered in people's lives. I'm thinking today a source of tension or conflict in society is the rights or, of lawmakers to comment on people's sex lives or sexuality. And does Brehan Law have anything to say on this issue? I mean, in the sense that they wanted um, spouses to stay uh, loyal so the offspring could be guaranteed which is important in an illegal sense. But most of what was said about people's sex lives in medieval Ireland comes from the church. No surprise. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the penitentials, for example, which are the kind of guidebooks uh, about sin, um, w- which were circulated then uh, amongst the clergy, um, which talks about punishments. Uh, they talk a lot about punishments for sexual acts. It appears to have been front and centre. No surprise there. Uh, it tells you quite a bit about about what was or what might have been going on. The, the, the problem is, of course, is you look at these um, kind of old old manuscripts and, and documents and you think, did it actually happen or is this what they're afraid of? But anyway, that that's what's there. So it's front and centre to their concerns. So, for example, um, the stuff in there that's quite surprising, though, as well. I mean, I mean, Gaelic Ireland is is a society in which relationships are multifarious. They're they're much like, um, well, they're not at all like what people imagine the past to be. So there are families in Gaelic Ireland where, you know, you you have a stepdad, you you have a stepmother, you might have a couple of mothers because your dad might have a a wife and a concubine. Uh, you'll have stepbrothers and sisters. You may have English stepbrothers and sisters. You may have Gaelic stepbrothers and sisters. There's lots and lots of types of families that existed in Gaelic Ireland and to a certain extent on the border areas between Gaelic and English areas that people today would find much more recognisable than your the idea of a nuclear family. Although 
that's never really existed in Gaelic Ireland. It is about your sprawling kin and it's about um, people, adults who enter into short term relationships. There's, there's a part in, in the Brehan Laws, there's, there's one section that talks about as well, which is interesting. If a man, if a husband can't give a wife a baby, if there is, you know, something that that's not quite working for him, she can go and get impregnated by another man and the husband can bring that child up as his own. So when you talk about that, it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a a world which now we are becoming a bit more familiar with. Uh, it's by no means the the more frigid and, and you know, colder world of the kind of noble Gael who was a strong Catholic that that dominated the ideas about Gaelic Ireland for like the 19th century and maybe into the 20th. It's a society where relationships begin and end. It's a society where um, a woman can come along to a chieftain and say, you and I slept together a year ago. Here's the baby from that. And if the chieftain accepted him, the baby became one of the claimants to the chieftain's uh, title. Vital. It's a world where illegitimacy doesn't even exist. They've no conception of it. So it, it is something that, you know, for Ireland today, which is massively changing socially, it, it's it's a time that I think we can probably much more identify with. Um, of course, it's not the same, but there is an idea. There's a there's a, a give and take in the idea of relationships, which is which is reflected in the law codes because they try to to, to cover for it they say there's nine types of marriage because they know people are out there doing these things and they want to give some kind of legal framework and protection um to the people involved in this particularly uh, as was usually the case the ones who suffered were women and children who weren't covered by a legal framework um but the church's the church was um as the middle ages went on um more and more against it um, so 11th and 12th centuries, they brought out lots of reforms to try and stop this, but they never really stopped it through most of the Middle Ages, um, you know, uh, especially in Gaelic areas, which were maybe far away from crown forces. You still do find, you know, areas where priests have, have wives, bishops have wives um, and are accepted as such and are kind of eulogised in the annals um, and major families would marry a child off to a bishop. Um, and in the penitentials as well, they talk a lot about things like um, they'll talk about abortion, um, which, again, was a hot topic in Ireland uh, recently. They'll, the, the penances they give for abortion, though, are quite low. For example, in one of them, uh, they give a penance for four to five years for oral sex and abortion. The penance is six months. So it's a, there's a realism there. There's an acceptance that this is happening. And also, of course, there's the idea which which happened as well in the Middle Ages that the church didn't believe um, a bit, that the fetus was uh, viable until ensoulment had taken place. So there's issues about when the abortion happened and so on. But there is a, a recognition um, that that in a, a very in a in a world where relationships changed or could change or could be added to or people died and married again and again of course there's no such real thing as marriage not religious marriage marriage was a secular affair so marriage was a contract entered in, into by two families and then they'd often have a bit of a feast but you know people people for most of the middle ages didn't formally go to church they didn't have a big marriage ceremony that's all quite recent that's post 16th century so they just turned up had a marriage they went yeah i'll take you you take me more or less and that was it and then so there's no idea of kind of as i've said illegitimacy because it, it wasn't it wasn't a thing in gaelic minds until until later on so yeah, uh, the, the laws, I would say, uh, were accepting of a society where relationships changed. The church tried to control it, but to a large extent failed quite a bit in the Gaelic lordships. And then, I guess, this, given we're talking about uh, the later Middle Ages, things like magic, superstition and witchcraft, I think are probably never far from people today thinking back on it anyway. And certainly it is a, a, a feature of later medieval society in the Norman colony. You can see it in things like the witchcraft uh, trial in Kilkenny in 1324 yeah. and elsewhere. Is this a feature in Gaelic society and in particular? Is it covered under Brehan law? Well, um, yeah, so you, you do you do get it. You do get references to it. So um, what's interesting in, in Gaelic society, of course, is the fact that um, the literature is full of really strong magical women. Like, for example, the Morrigan, 
uh, who uses battle magic, um, which is referenced. Um, so you also do get you get a reference to um, a magical practice. It's not a female one, but you get a reference to druids using a poppet as well in one of the tracts. So they go up to the top of a hill where there's a hawthorn tree. Uh, they have a poppet of an individual they want to harm. They take a thorn from the tree and then they keep pricking it and saying this uh, ritual kind of thing about hurting this individual. Um, so, so definitely there's the magical rituals are involved in, in life in day to day. You do get you do get like women who are uh, involved in magic, like in the rest of the Middle Ages, uh, women became associated particularly with love magic. And that's what they're associated with, especially in the eyes of the clergy in Ireland. Um, in uh, The Deer's Cry, which is a, p- a poem, a prayer ascribed to St. Patrick, he asks for help against the, sp- the spells of um, women, smiths and druids. So there's this idea that women do have this otherworldly power. No further mention is made of smiths and druids, but that's fine because women tend to be the scapegoats. Um, and there are there are uh, references in, in some of the uh, legal texts to what... Um, I mean, it's it's a type of sex magic. So, but it's uh, designed. No one ever thinks of Irish sex magic, but um, so this is kind of negative sex magic. So it's actually called a literal translation of what's happening is the supernatural attack of a bed. So what what the text refers to is the idea that um, either a woman or a third party curses her husband so he cannot have sex with her. Now, why would you do that? Well, you do that because the law tracks say that you can divorce him if he's impotent. Um, so, I mean, the idea of what they would have used is, is, is you know, intriguing as well. So it, they may have used a charm, some kind of spell. Irish people were petrified of charms to a large extent, but they, they saw great power in them. Or there's an idea as well that they use some kind of ritual object in the bed and that stopped the man from performing. And so she could then, uh, get a divorce from him. But there's also very famous examples, of course, as well in the lives of the saints, um, of saints basically performing magic. So St. Bridget was approached uh, by a man and he's described as a man who his wife hated, which is <laughs> always nice. And um, he asked St. Bridget for help and she she kind of blessed some water. She, she said ritual words over it and sprinkled it on the woman and then she loved her husband forever. Uh, St. Bridget also uh, um, made a fetus disappear, uh, along with uh, with several other saints who, who you know, whose hagiographers thought it's fine. Uh, they can make a fetus disappear, which is interesting because the audience who would listen to that obviously didn't think that would that would have been massively shocking. And again, it ties back to the idea that abortions happened then and they were a part of life, which is attested to in the literature and, and the laws. So, yeah, there is magic. There is magic. There's there's people who practice magic. There would have been the, the magical class, you know, who were called the Druids. Uh, these appear to have been predominantly male. There's very few references to, to female practitioners of anything, really, in the Irish texts. There's an early reference to a female physician, an interesting one, though, is everyone hated female satirists uh, because there's a branch of poetry called satire, which I'm sure you're aware of. And that was seen to be magical because it could have real world effects. I mean, you could kill someone with a satire. So everyone dreaded female satirists. And it was said that they shouldn't have custody of their children because they were just appalling. Um, but I mean, um, again, Probably it's to do with the fact that it is a, it is a subversion of the common good to have a female magician, to have a woman um, who can wield that kind of power is an uncontrollable element in a strictly hierarchical, hierarchical and, and patriarchal society. So that is something to be deeply feared and that informs views of women performing magic. So it's it's probably more to do with that than the fact that there was a witch on every corner, which I sincerely doubt. But, you know, you never know. So you've been talking there about, I guess, a legal system that exists for the guts of a thousand years. Um, yeah, pretty comes, much. Yeah. So if it comes to an end, then sometime in the 16th century, can you explain maybe how it unravels or is it? Uh, yeah, well, it, it it doesn't it doesn't really come to an end abruptly. It's a, a long, painful, uh, drawn out process, to be honest. Um, once the Tudors turn their attention uh, to Ireland, 
everything starts to um, unravel. Um, so Henry VIII declared himself uh, King of Ireland in 1541. Of course, the dissolution of the monasteries started shortly before that in Ireland as well. Um, you begin to get English adventurers a bit later on turning their attention towards Ireland as a source of profit, um, and especially under, say, Elizabeth. And into the 17th century, there's just an endless series of, um, well, genocides and famines and land grabs and um, ancient kind of families being, you know, bardic families and, uh, you know, Brehan, law, Brehan lawyers being turned out of where they lived and the old system being dismantled thanks to rebellion and put downs. And eventually, by the end of the 16th century, after the plantations um, and the horrendous, um, you know, Cromwellian interludes and so on, um, Gaelic Ireland was, was basically wiped out to a large extent and the culture that went with it disappeared um, as the, the whole idea behind it. I mean, uh, the Tudors begin to look at it and, and everything is, is characterised as, as barbarous. That's not to say it wasn't before, you know. I mean, this 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 incidents in the Middle Ages where, you know, there's 1298 and the parliament is convened in, in Ireland, an Anglo-Irish parliament, and they say, you know, English men have to stop looking and behaving like Irish men and stop taking Irish wives and stuff like that. You know, the, the idea is that the Irish were... Uh, barbarous and less civilised, but that really reaches its pinnacle um, in the Tudor period uh, and beyond. Um, so um, it's it's a gradual breakdown. It's a very, it's a slow and, and very tragic ending, really. I mean, say what you like about it. It was a, a, a very complex and a very, um, a very sophisticated a system that worked for people um, within those uh, uh, rural areas dominated by the Tua. And it was a remarkable system because it went along with a Gaelic culture that stretched across the Irish Sea. So they could, uh, um, you know, a Brehan could travel from Ireland and into Scotland. Uh, a poet could as well. And it's a similar type of universal Gaelic culture, which which basically came to a, a, a sorry end. I mean, a lot of people say it kind of ended, you know, after the flight of the Earls and stuff like that. It, it took longer than that. There, there's still some evidence of um, law school, a law school in the early 18th century, but it dies out. The country couldn't maintain that culture anymore. Um, there was the systems that held it in place disappeared and were uh, swept away um, in the face of, well, I suppose the only way you could, the only thing you could call it is genocide. So it, it's an, a viable attempt to wipe out a culture and it almost worked, um, but didn't quite. So, yeah, we we lost a lot, obviously, from it. But I mean, again, enough survived that we can track and trace the culture um, and see the effect it had on, on Irish society over a thousand years. And, and it is remarkable, um, the kind of stuff that went on. Um, and the kind of society that upheld it. I'd like to thank Gillian for taking the time to talk to me. You can find Gillian on Twitter at Medieval Jill, that's Medieval, G-I-L-L, so it's Medieval Jill, all one word, on Twitter. In the next episode, I'll be returning to the story of The Great Hunger, where we will see how it came to an end, focusing on my hometown of Kilkenny and one of the city's most famous rebels, the Fenian James Stevens. Until next time, Sloan.